the uh, youth, adolescent, and child work group. If that's where you think you're supposed to be, you're in the right place. Welcome if you have not been here before. Um, our meeting purpose is to uh, refresh our re collective knowledge from last meeting, share resources, um, learn from parents in our community through feedback uh, from members as well. So we had some homework on that. We'll check in and see how that went. Um, so for now, we will um, kind of review meeting purpose, which I went over that information, um, and then we'll approve uh, meeting minutes from last time. Does anybody want to move to approve? No. I would skip this. Thank you. Dr. Or no, oh, sorry, Doug Kramer. I was like, I'm not, I'm not in the place. <laughs> you have all the things. Sorry, Doug. You need to sit together. Sorry, Doug. Um, anybody second? So we have a speaker on with us today on by Zoom. Um, it's John Stephen from the Stephen Group. Um, so, John, do you want to introduce yourself and then talk to us a little bit about your program? Sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, thank you. Okay. My name is John Stephen. With me today is Nanette Simmons from the Department of Health and Human Services at DCFS. And Nanette is the project manager for the department. Um, we are, I represent the Stephen Group which is the consultant that group that's been hired by the state uh, to help them through their uh, legislative bill 1173 planning process. The 1173 bill that passed, some of you may know, and again, I wanna thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk with you, is a real innovative, transformative process going forward right now in Nebraska. Um, my team has experience as, as subject matter experts in child welfare nationally. I'm a former secretary of HHS overseeing a child welfare program as well, as well as experience in uh, attorney general's office and prosecuting child sex abuse cases. And I have a number of team members that are working with the state to really try to um, pave the way for what will be a transformation in the next session, the next year. So what I wanted to do today, real brief, is to give everyone a quick background of 1173, just so that you all are aware. And then really what I'd like to do is just for whatever time we have, open it up for some discussion on a couple questions. And whatever time we don't have today, we can make ourselves available. We're gonna be at Columbus for a, a community hearing um, in on the 4th of April. And we have a number of other community forums we're going to be doing and we, in our all of our schedules posted on the website that I'll, I'll talk to you about in a minute. So with that in mind, I wanted to go over 1173. Before I start, does anyone have any questions? Okay, and everybody can hear. Go ahead. I'll be in Kearney May 31st, correct? Yes, yes, Kearney is May 31st. Is that right, Nanette? I'm pretty sure. Yes, correct. Thank you, Nadette. Um, so real brief, 1173 is really, um, and I would say it's it's a one piece of legislation we haven't seen in many states. And I also consult with Annie Casey Foundation. We do a lot nationally. This was a, a bill where the, the legislature said all sectors of government, including courts, probation, child welfare, um, tribal nations even, as they're considered agencies, all work together in an intersectoral manner. They use the term intersectoral in the bill to develop what's called an integrated model, a new practice and finance model for child welfare in the state of Nebraska. And to do that with partnerships, collective information, collaboration, and information from the legislative, executive, and judicial branches with community stakeholders. So what we've been doing is really reaching out to a number of different entities, meeting, and we have met with a few of the collaboratives already, or at least a couple discussions. Um, and we met with Jennifer and her team in, in Nebraska and Lincoln uh, a week ago. And we, we are very aware of the prevention efforts going on, which are really great. Um, 
And we want to make sure that the work group that's set up by 1173, which we are um, working on behalf of, is fully advised of what's going on in the community. And the work group itself, there's a statutory work group in 1173. It's made up of department members that represent behavioral health, Medicaid, child welfare. The CEO sits on a strategic leadership group. That work group also has the Department of Education, the courts. Um, it has representatives from each of the federally recognized Indian tribes. And again, uh, the court administrator. And there are other members that are being added to that work group by the work group itself, because it says that that the in the statute that you can include additional members of that work group. Outside of that work group are the stakeholders, the larger group. We met with at a kickoff we had in Omaha in uh, February, early February. And we continue to meet with stakeholders along the way and have focus groups. We're going to have a survey, um, survey sent out to the county attorneys in the next few days. So there's a lot of outreach going on and we want we want to make sure we hear your voices. And again, so you have three groups. You have the general large stakeholder groups out there. You have the work group that's got to present the actual framework. And then you have this strategic leadership group that's made up of uh, the leg legislators, the court, chief justice, and the CEO at, D at DHHS. And that strategic group is being given updates every month by the work group. And the deliverable is on December 1st, on or before, the work group will present to the legislature their what's called child welfare practice framework and finance framework for transformation. So this is not the actual transformation that this is the framework. And it's a framework that everybody can get behind in, in going forward. So it's really important that we listen to a lot of folks. We're hearing from those with lived experiences, but I wanna just make sure it's clear that my team is not inventing this or coming up with best practice from other states. And we're looking at everything Nebraska has already built into the system as a starting point. So all the great work that's been going on is, is being used now and we're building off of that. But we're here just to make sure that the work group, again, um, gets subject matter expertise from best practices and from other areas. Like, for example, on FFPSA, we're helping them understand what Family First Prevention Services Act is about. We know real time, for example, yesterday, the state of Florida was presented a letter by the Administration of Children, Youth and Families about their candidacy definition. We're trying to track all of the new and innovative things going on in the prevention side out there. But we also want to make sure what we recommend and what the work group has is, again, Nebraska-centric. Very excited about this effort for you all. And one of the issues we've been asking folks in the community is, you know, what are some of the current issues you're seeing? What are the current issues that you want to make sure the work group is aware of? The emerging, emerging issues, current state. And then the second piece would be really you know, more in the solutioning. What is the, what, what do you want to see in the vision? What do you want to see as we go forward in, in Nebraska or you all in the next few years? And, and that's really thinking, thinking ahead. We've heard from families about their voices wanting to be heard. We've heard from the tribes. We've heard from a lot of community stakeholders already. So I don't want to take up a lot of time on 1173. Nanette has a PowerPoint we put together with all the details that she can make available to every one of the Buffalo County members in this meet, in the, the Buffalo County um, group, your collaborative group. And I wanna make sure that I know who, who you all are, who's in the room, where you come from, and um, what do you wanna tell the work group? And again, I, I will be able to, in Kearney, maybe while Nanette's on the phone here, we could work around the, the actual community forum if you, think it's, if you think it's important and come out and meet with you one-on-one -on -one at your, at your location. And an issue that I'm, I'm, I'm going to have at some point is I really want to know um, resources, resource needs. What is the capacity of the community today? And what does the community really need in Nebraska to really do something special going forward? Maybe even something that has not even been done in any state. So in any event, um, be happy to answer questions. We're, again, we have a website. 
and info at Stephen Group. And my last name is S T E P H E N Group I N C dot com. You can you can send and any information, and that's all contained on the website. And the website is Reimagining Child Wellbeing. And that's all on the PowerPoint deck that we have put together that Nanette will make available for you all. And Camus has a copy too. So anyways, I'm going to open it up if that's if that's good. If we, you know, I didn't have an agenda. Camus didn't give me an agenda for the meeting, but let's have a free dis flow discussion. And I'm going to take a lot of notes and let's just use the time wisely and I'll be able to answer any questions you have. Does that work? Yes, Don, that works yes, well. That works well. And maybe just recognize yourself so I can I can make sure I I capture that too. I appreciate. You know, John, I'll so, start people who, are trying to process maybe everything that you've been saying. I think that a new piece that I've seen happen in Carney um, is a piece that this group endorsed. And so Kearney Public School Systems is the first in the state of Nebraska to secure the support of the Student Assistance Program, which now provides mental health supports and coaching to every <clears throat> student um, fourth grade, sixth, sixth, sixth grade to 12th grade through a virtual forum in multiple languages. It was probably one of the most significant gaps we have um, had as a community. So we're really, really excited about that piece. Uh, and they've made that financial investment. It would be really interesting to see what something like that statewide might look like if uh, that model could be uh, implemented throughout the state. So I'm just going to get started, started off with that one. I bet Can I, I ask a question, a follow-up on that model? You said sixth yeah. grade. Is that model being funded by the county, the state Department of Education, are the Department of Education involved? The school system itself is paying for it. Out of our general budget. General budget from the Kearney Public Schools, correct. Okay, thank you. We just rolled it out yesterday to our Bearcat time. So it was wow. uh, presented to the students at Kearney High School. Packets were given. We had need parent permission to be on board so that they can access the services through our contracted providers and the student assistance program. So we're working on getting in consent forms and everything. Can you make that. that packet available to us? I'm sure I can. I, would, I need I would, permission just to okay, Miss will get it to us. I'd, love, I'd like that model to look at. Thank you. I don't know, Emily, maybe we could do our resource sharing and have comments as we need to go. Would that work maybe and give them some feedback? So share your resources and if you have some additional comments, because I think I also heard him say he's interested in resources. Yeah, so John, part of our um, meeting consists of all of the um, people in the room sharing out about the resources that their organization um, is bringing to the table. Um, so we'll go ahead and go around the room and do that so you can kind of hear what's happening in our community. Um, just understand a little bit about the work group. Um, so I will go first. So I said um, before, my name is Emily Leem and I'm a community engagement manager with Unite Us. And we are a um, cross-sector collaborative technology platform where providers can electronically refer their clients to other providers in the community. Uh, 211 is our coordination center. So providers can also refer to 211 to send electronic referrals. People can self-refer in to um, different organizations, also through 211 or directly through that organization. And then we track all of the data outcomes um, associated with um, people getting connected to care. So um, we pull um, age, race, gender, ethnicity information, underserved populations, health equity, health disparities. Um, how long did it get? take to get connected to care, what are co-occurring needs across Nebraska. Um, and we're not just in Nebraska, we're across the United States. Um, we're in 44 other states. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do. Um, John, you and I could maybe connect offline um, and chat a little bit more um, about some of the things that we have in the works. Um, we'll head that direction. Real quick question, follow up. If if can I ask questions? If there's a real brief, just to follow up, is one of them. Do you Absolutely. do it? Does that system do assessments? 
Yes, we have the prepare screening tool, which is a national assessment, and I can send you some information on it. Um, it's a baseline assessment of um, social determinants of health for whole person care. So you can ask about 30 questions of a client. It takes about two minutes. And then based on their responses to those questions, so domestic violence, mental health, education, employment, food insecurity, housing, based on their answers, it pumps out suggested referral areas, like areas of opportunity for them. Um, and once you fill that out, any organization working with that client has visibility over that assessment. Um, I am Brenda Horner. I'm with the Brain Injury Alliance of Nebraska. This is my, my first in-person meeting. Um, we cover the whole state and it is specific to brain injury, um, children through adults of any ages. So um, we're just kind of here to see what we can help with in this department. Um, I've worked with children myself in special education for 18 years before I came to this part. So the, the child part is very near to me. Um, so we offer case management. We have assessments as well that we, that we, we cover everything, homeless, domestic violence, foster care, um, birth injuries, if, if a baby has lack of oxygen from birth, um, just to support the families and get them to brain injury specific professional. We're also part of Unite Us. We're trying to be a little bit more involved with, but that is a little bit about us. And Brenda, I'm going to jump in there as well. Um, John, this is a significant need in the community of that case management around brain injury. Um, we don't have a lot of resources there to support that type of case management. And we're seeing the individuals that we're serving through community response um, that we're, you know, the Brain Injury Alliance is full. Uh, we just don't have the capacity in the state to serve those with brain injuries. And they need significant supports um, in getting to meetings and things like that. The other piece that I love about what Brenda is doing um, and her team is they've also started screening and juvenile justice for brain injuries. And Brenda, off the top of your head, 70 odd, we can get you the exact numbers, yeah. John, but at least 70 to 80 percent of youth that are going through diversion are reporting multiple brain injuries. That's before they get even in yes. justice. So there's a lot to unpack there, John, and um, just want to make sure you are hearing those pieces. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to keep jumping in on things that I know that are going to be really important for the state to hear today. Yes, yeah, so we have a lot of data and that kind of stuff too, if you if you ever need that, we can get that sent. Thank you, Brenda. Hi, I'm Megan, um, and this is Wendy. We are a new program with Kearney Police Department and Buffalo County Sheriff's Office. So. Um, we're a part of the co-response program. Um, my role is to be with officers in the response to 911 calls that are trauma related. So I'll do mental health calls um, if somebody's expressing suicidality um, to help do assessments and safety plan to see if we can divert from DPCs. Um, I also go to domestic violence calls, death calls, any type of trauma. And so also juvenile and child abuse calls. Um, so we started maybe early January kind of and we're really starting to get the ball rolling more in March. So this past month, we are seeing a lot more utilization and Wendy's job is to also help you follow up um, to make sure that you know the plans that we put in place are getting followed through, connecting them with resources and things like that. So yeah, it's brand new, but um, we are starting to see a lot of uh, use and, and success. So. And John, can I ask a question on that? Can I just follow up? That's really important. Um, we we did speak last week with the Buffalo County Sheriff's, the Sheriff and also Sheriff Association. This co-response, is this something that is being funded again by the, the law enforcement? Is it come from a state or a federal grant? Is it something that is supported by the state of Nebraska? So as far as I know with the grant and the way that it's written, it's both, I think it's some state funding and federal funding. I know that the grant is for two years. And so it just was started, I think November, October, November. And so we'll have about two years for the grant. And the hope is that eventually the city might pick it up. That's the hope. Division of Aid Rural Health, right? Is the funder? Through region yeah, three. Region three. Through region yeah. three. Yeah. So one of the regions, region three is what we're a part of is the, the grant funding. And I believe there's also some Medica funding. I believe there too. Yep. 
I believe there's very few models of this co-responder in the state of Nebraska. We are so excited to have Megan here in Buffalo County, and we'll open it up for other questions because we wanted to give Megan some time for all of you to, to ask questions as well. This is the first time we're all getting a, a chance to engage with both of them. Uh, Grand Island, I believe, has co-responder, yes. and I think Lincoln and Omaha have co-responder, yeah. and I think that's the only communities right now covered in this model, which is fantastic. We have seen this gap in our community for quite some time, and we are all very excited to have um, Megan and Wendy here doing this work. Questions you guys all have for Megan and Wendy? Are you excited they're here? Oh my God, I have a dream. I do have a question. So the Green Island, Lincoln, Omaha positions, do they fall under LFS as well? Yes, right now. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, I don't believe Omaha. I okay. think Omaha was absorbed into they're just police department. So I think they might be separate from LFS. Okay. But I believe Lincoln and Grand Island still are. Okay. Yeah. Lutheran Family Services. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. All the acronyms. That's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Questions for Megan and Lindsay, guys? I have to do this, of course. <laughs> are you the only one in your position? Yes. Yeah. So right now it's just me and her. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I really love that model. I just, I wanted to just say one more thing about like best practice. Um, did you, are you connected in anywhere in Nebraska with the handle with care model? Uh, I'm not aware of that now. Where, where co-responders have gone out and is, if there's a traumatic event, there's children, they go to school the next day, that there's a yes. message that goes to the school, handle with care from the bus driver to the teachers, to the to the counselors, to the nurses in the schools are treating that child or those children a lot differently. They don't need to know the confidentiality, the information. Is there any such program like that in Nebraska that you're aware of? It's a national program called Handle with Care. So I don't know if it's Handle with Care exactly. I do know that Region 3 does help with things like that. So we had a team that had died by suicide last, a month and a half ago in Ravenna, and Region 3 handled most of that kind of stuff. Joan, I think we could say that we're doing it, but probably not under the auspices of what that is entitled. Um, and we can maybe learn from that model as well. We've, we've been piecemealing it together because you're talking with a community that works really well together and makes sure that we're handing off pieces. And Megan's team did a fantastic job in region responding to that, that recent use to the side. Any other questions for Megan? <clears throat> Because I don't remember, are there certain times like where you're busier, and so that's when you're made available, or is it? Are we still, still kind of that? figuring that out? <laughs> so right now it's mostly day hours, Monday through Friday, but we're kind of starting to adjust a little bit and see what our on call might look like. Um, so that's kind of in the flux right now. And are there thoughts of expanding um, beyond the one Megan and having to make it? Hopefully, yeah. So once we get utilized more and it's more structured and we have more of a program really put in place, um, the hope is that we could have a second person. Yeah, especially if we start getting really utilized and there's night hours, I can't be on call 24 seven. So if there's a second person and we could be more available, yeah. So. Grand Island does have two co-responders mm -hmm. now. Cause like, they time to keep the covers. How do um bilingual um get services? So right Can now I'm we please. use officers to help translate. Um, we also have a program that helps. We have a little one. yeah translate. So we have like translators that we use, but that's what we have so far. But we're practicing our Spanish. <laughs> we're trying. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Another significant gap, John, is uh, materials, resources, people power. <laughs> and, I, and I want to say more like people. People. Yeah. yeah. People. I just want to share just because I know Martha yeah. had yeah. sent it out that there is going to be a training for anyone that's in behavioral health um, that might not be bilingual but works with people who might be bilingual on how to like the best practices on how to serve um, that population because you know it's not just here dial this number and listen to this when you're in crisis so there is a training coming up and i think martha said may 19th may 19th so yeah 211 has transition 
services available as well. Dr. Hurley. Megan, I'm just curious on the on the actual process and mm -hmm. the like follow up and referral process, how how that'll work or yeah. So right now, as what we have in place is I'm pretty much in a car with an officer at all times. So when calls come out, I'm like, hey, that's a call that I can go help with, and I will go to that call. So I'm trying to be on scene as soon as possible to try to already start doing crisis management and helping in that process alongside officers. Um, after a call finishes, then I pass that information to Wendy, and Wendy does follow up within 24, 48 hours. Hopefully, yeah. Unless it's a week, like, yeah, it's on a Friday or something, yeah. So then I just reach out to the person um, by calling them if it's a cell phone and they don't answer and they don't have a voicemail, then I will text and just say, because I don't answer my phone if I don't know what their number is. So I just text them and tell them who I am and just checking in with you and just find out what services that they need. Um, as if they need mental health services, who can I can connect them with? If there's other things, if they're needing housing assistance, if they're, you know, just whatever. I have a binder and I just keep adding more resources to it. Just try to learn everything I can that's available in Kearney to help people. Um, and I also am a peer support specialist, so I can help with that ongoing peer support as well. Um, kind of piggybacking off the processing question. So like when you uh, co-respond to a call, do are you the first person to talk with the individual or are we still having police officers be the first point of contact? It depends on the type of call, but there have been calls where I was the first person and there have been many calls where I just said, hey, can you just make sure things are safe outside and then I'll just take over the call from there. Um, so there are times where I'm pretty much the only person that they're talking to. Great questions. Well, everybody now knows Megan and Wendy, mm -hmm. so their contact information uh, we can share with you as well if you have additional questions you want to share with them. And thank you for coming, ladies. We're, we welcome you to this table. Thank you. Yeah, so I am Jana Miller. I'm the Behavioral Health Coordinator at Community Partners. Um, some of the work that I do is early childhood. So that's kind of what I'm going to focus on for the resources that I have today. We were provided an opportunity to re receive just a little bit of funding. Um, so thanks to the grantor for We Care for Kids, we were able to provide lunch today. So that's the resource I'm going to provide. Um, but We Care for Kids is basically just a statewide campaign, um, but it's more of a grassroots effort. So working with community organization. So they're working with our um, community collaboratives and our early childhood groups and trying to uh, build that awareness in the community on why early childhood um, is so important, why quality child access to quality child care is important and how it impacts our children and families and how it impacts our econ economy so that our families can get to work um, by having access to high quality child care. So I just wanted to just briefly show this website. Um, I would just ask all of you to get connected on that. I think they just do like a newsletter, but knowing what's going on around the state and in our community is so important. Um, the best way to describe it is even though you may not be affected by childcare, if you go to the bank, if you go to the grocery store, if you have any service within the community, the people that work at the bank and work at the grocery store or work at your local schools, they do need childcare. And if they don't have access to quality childcare, they can't get to work. So it is just this um, economy piece that we need to really start understanding how investing in early childhood affects our community. Um, so I won't share too much, but there are a lot of really cool community tools, press releases, talking points, um, social media pieces. And so our Early Childhood Collaborative can take a look at that. But I would just encourage you as a community member, as a parent, as a friend, as a neighbor to take a look at that too, so that you can um, understand that language to be able to share that with anyone that you talk to. Um, and then along those same lines, I just want to share some cool work that we are doing in Buffalo County. So we um, 
have taken this model where we have four child care providers that um, have been in the community for a long time. They're high quality child care providers. They've been engaged with us for the last five years. We are now able to pay for their time to basically be a mentor. We're calling them champions to be a mentor to other individuals in the community. Started off one with those who are interested in licensing. So they're interested in child care, but they know that it's it's lonely. It's a long process. I don't know if I can do all the paperwork. I don't know if I can be a part of that. So they're just, they're calling. It's basically just like that peer-to-peer -peer model. They're calling, they're saying, I can help you. Um, and they're walking them through that process. And they're they're creating access to childcare. And then they can show them what quality is and say, you know, th th this is the route that I've taken. And to be able to do that. And then as of this week, we are adding two bilingual childcare um, providers in the community. Um, so they're going to be doing outreach. It will look a little bit different. Their job is really going to be building that relationship piece at first. Um, and then if we can build those relationships to talk through, I would guess that we're going to uncover a lot of barriers to becoming licensed before we get anyone licensed. So that's what we're doing locally. My name is Martha Martileño, and I work at Buffalo County Community Partners. I'm the wellness coordinator and the bilingual central navigator. Um, the piece that I can share for resources is around food insecurity, and we've done uh, a lot of work with our Kearney area farmers market to be able to bring SNAP as a form of payment at the farmers market so that people can access local fresh fruits and vegetables, meats and dairy, so that they can use their SNAP benefits there. We've also added uh, the Double Up Food Bucks incentive program too. Um, Omaha and Lincoln were the only two cities that offered that. So it's really neat to be able to provide that here in Buffalo County. Um, we're continuing to provide capacity for them to uh, provide those two food assistance programs so that families and seniors that are using SNAP benefits can shop at the farmer's market and then extend their dollars with the incentive program that's called Double Up Food Bucks. Um, we've worked to provide flyers in English and Spanish, so we're trying to make sure that we're um, getting that information out to everyone who is also uh, primarily Spanish speaking and just working to sustain those food assistance programs at the farmer's market. I'm Doug Kramer. I'm with the Buffalo County Attorney's Office here in Kearney. I'm an administrator for all the juvenile services programs. Currently, we have four programs that work with approximately 800 youth a year, and that's in Buffalo and Sherman counties. So we cover 11 different communities. We added up all the towns, villages in both counties. Um, Diversion probably uh, gives us the most customers. Um, we have a diversion program for 17 and younger for first-time offenders. We also have a diversion program for minor in possession only for 18, 19, and 20 year olds. Uh, we do a truancy program for all of Buffalo County. Um, we don't do the Sherman County one, that's through central mediation. Um, that's about 150 to 200 youth a year that come through that program. And then approximately 75 youth a year come through our uncontrollable, what we would call um, status offenses for youth. Um, basically runaways, just, I, I almost call them parenting issues at times, but there's a variety of different things that come into play there. Um, so a lot more with that, but we refer um, most of the youth to services throughout the county. So we utilize all of you and your services as service providers and work with several of you and, um, you know, at this point, it seems like business is too good. Um, biggest need I think we have right now is just <clears throat> services for youth on substance abuse, things like vaping seems to be going younger and younger. Uh, youth are getting that sometimes at home from parents or family friends. I use that word loosely, but it seems like they're bringing more and more of the vaping things. And also THC wax seems to be a big one now that's Kind of getting out there. So there's some overdose leads and some things that um, shouldn't be happening. Doug, can I um can I just ask Doug if you'd be available and the net's on the line too. Maybe you can put in the chat your email address 
so I can come out and meet with you when we're in the Kearney area. I, you know, being a former county attorney, um, I, I really want to dig deep into some of these issues going forward, what that vision can be like for county attorneys in the future in, in Nebraska, working closely with both juvenile justice and child welfare, and especially yeah, on the prevention of, side, too. So our, our funds come through the Nebraska Crime Commission. Um, a lot of the things they do are the community-based juvenile justice grants and juvenile justice grants. Um, and I can, I'll forward you some information on contacts there. Um, on the day that you'll be here on the 31st, there is going to be a Nebraska screen and assessment tool training. That's the NSAT. It's a new screening tool that has been developed through um, Juvenile Justice Institute at UNO and the Nebraska Crime Commission. And that's something that I think all diversion programs throughout the state are going to start utilizing in the next year. Um, it's an assessment tool. We, we right now in our program use the MAZI, the Massachusetts Youth Screening Instrument, just for a real brief. Um, it's a, I won't say detention screen because none of the youth we work with are, are in detention. That's more or less reserved for higher level needs, the youth that maybe are assessed to not be safe on their own or the community is not safe if they're out on their own. So um, I, I'll also forward Sean Atherton's information to you. He's the Buffalo County attorney and Heather Sitka is the uh, Sherman County attorney that we work with. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm Nikki Peterson. I'm the Kearney High School social worker. The only thing that I wanted to talk about because we talked about the student assistance program is that we are doing a craft and vendor fair at Kearney High School on April 1st from 9 to 3. We have 70 plus vendors that are coming. And this is supporting our food pantry that we have at the high school. So I have a self-sustaining food pantry that I provide um, weekly groceries to students at the high school. So the fees that our vendors have paid to get into our craft fair are going for me to purchase groceries for our food pantry. I've been paying um, some bills for family. So accessing um, this money has helped our students. So I just want to promote the craft and vendor <laughs> show to promote um, supporting our students at the high school. So I can forward you a copy so you can send it on to everybody. It goes right back. All this money goes right to support our students. So love for y'all to help promote it for our kiddos. And John, this program started with a, a CHI grant to start social workers. Um, I believe two social workers started. We got a Padres grant 15 years ago. 15 years yeah, ago? Yeah, there was three of us that started the program. Two of us are still with the program, been here 15 years. We started in elementary only, and now we're preschool to 21. So we serve all area students. We serve all the buildings. So our social work group has grown now to nine social workers. I don't know too many other schools that do what Kearney Public Schools does with social workers, which um, the other rural communities have really been very interested in how to replicate that program and also lift a little bit of the weight from our, our school counselors and other staff in the schools to support um, those basic needs or social needs of students. Uh, I know ESU 10 has had some conversations about this as well. So the educational service units have a, a vested interest in this as well. And I don't know if they're on your, your list of people to talk to, but that that piece too, it, it would be a phenomenal um, growth for the state of Nebraska as well. ESU 10 recently hired three LHPs from the last year or two years ago to serve their rural schools. And I think they're looking at expanding that program. And we would love to expand our social work program. We are very busy. We would like to have a social worker in every building. We know that there's needs at every building. You know, even your more affluent buildings, they, there's still grief and trauma. You know, there's building needs in every building. So we stay busy. And ESU covers 27 counties. Is that right? No. Twenty something. Can I ask a Can I ask a follow up question on the school program? Um, the the I really like that model, and I just want to ask as far as that maybe again the net's on the line, and the net really sets up our schedule in the community. I really want to meet with you when we're in Kearney separately than just the community forum. It's very important. This is going to be a big issue for the work group. And we heard from the sheriffs and the rural sheriffs, and the big issue was what can we do? Can this the schools are the safe place for the kids? And 
we need to do more in the schools. And part of education commissioner and their team are on the work group too. So there's a lot of discussion that's going to happen in this area. And the one, the question I have is, as you begin to start, you know, you've been there for a long time, 15 years. So is there currently a relationship between the CFS worker, the, the one that the report goes to the hot line for an abuse and neglect allegation. Is there a relationship between the CFS department at the time of that abuse and neglect reporting? Do you know about those reports? Do you ever find out about them early on so you can, you can work with those students before there's a removal and the system's working well together? Or is it, we really don't have that much of a relationship yet, I'd like to, and that could help. Does that, does that make sense? Jessica here is also a school social worker. We work a lot with HHS and over the years, I think that relationship really has become cohesive that we work well with them. We staff with the supervisors once a month yep. just to update on cases, if there's any concerns, anything that we need help supporting with. We do a great job working with our investigator that sends us the um, hotline reports. We are part of LB 1184. Mm -hmm. So we are very connected with our um, local HHS office. We have a great working relationship with them. The supervisors are great to us. So I feel like we are very much supported in that area. I feel like we have open lines of communication. And if we ever need anything, we can email the supervisors and they get back to us really quickly. So we tried really hard to connect with them. We were just, we presented them two weeks ago at a staff meeting. So I feel like we, do better um, with them just because we just try and make sure that we are in constant contact with them. Again, like you said, school is a safe place. We're with those kids eight hours a day. We know those kids. So we're kind of the go-to person when it comes to meeting the needs of those kids. Excellent. Um, I'm Jamie Legates from Families Care. Um, we provide family peer support to parents and families and youth that have mental and behavioral health challenges. So um, we have contracts with the Department of Behavioral Health and CFS, and then several with our local community collaborative collaboratives to provide those services in different, in different modes. Um, we have a transitional youth peer support specialist, and I've heard with me here today. He's just starting, so he's, he'll be part of this group as we move forward. Um, but we really um, work hard with families to help connect them to services that they need. Um, and a big piece of that, I think something we see a lot is parents not really understanding the, the menu of services that are available to them. So part of our role is to help educate them in understanding what is what they have in their community and how that can support their family and their children's um, mental health and wellness. Um, and then we also work to build those long-term wellness skills, you know, wrap planning and things like that to help them maintain um, the progress that they've made. Um, our transitional youth program, it works with youth from 15 or 16 through the age of 25. And um, that's a consumer to consumer peer model. Um, and family peer support is, um, and parent peer support is really supporting the parent to benefit the youth. Um, we also work through, um, through a SAMHSA grant that we had several years ago, we developed the Parent Leadership Academy, um, where we bring in parents who have that lived experience and train them in ways, um, learning how to share their story and how to participate in the different um, decision-making bodies that they're, that they're involved in on a local, state, and nationwide level. Um, so we do have, um, we're, we're kind of in this phase in that project where um, the funding is gone, but we're continuing the work and hoping to build a network of parents that are ready to share their story and help co-design programs um, as, as requested by agencies, so. And John there, they also have an intervention that we connect with community response, um, a parent, parent connect. <clears throat> Yeah, we have a parent connector program that's a phone based service, um, and that is like a weekly phone call with a parent. Um, we've, we've done that program for several years for different funding sources and different with different focuses. 
Um, but again, those those parents that are struggling with youth that are struggling um, and really supporting them and understanding how to how to make some progress in that way. And then we also do some coaching um, through Fall County Community Collaborative, um, HTC and Buffalo County Community Collaborative. Um, and that we really work with parents to um, do some financial goal setting and, and really assess their budget and find ways to make sure that ends meet at the end of the year. Jamie, do you guys still get referrals from HHS for family advocacy? We don't, we aren't family advocates anymore, okay. but yes, it's the same. I mean, it really is the same program. Okay. We, we walk beside those parents as they're going through their cases. We help them understand their case plan goals, find ways to meet those case plan goals. Um, and really, you know, as we're doing that, underneath that, we're saying, okay, where, how did we get here? And how do we make sure we don't get here again? So, and oftentimes, like the buffer between the worker and the family. Mm -hmm. um, so, John, the reason I bring this up is my background is in child protective services. Mm -hmm. um, and so, these are a lot of the programs that I worked with when I was a worker and a supervisor. Um, so, we referred everybody over to Families Care. So, they had an advocate, somebody in their corner to go to team meetings, court hearings run interference, maybe they fielded phone calls um, and then communicated with us if there wasn't a great relationship there. So I just think it's important to kind of include that relationship, even if it's evolved into something else. With that program, we do so have a digital. I, uh, I have a follow-up to that point because we heard from a group last week of, of peer support specialists that, um, and I've seen the statute and the rights of parents the right they have the right to peer support in Nebraska, which is great. Um, we are hearing that that many times they are not informed of that right until well into the system when their children are already taken out and there's months and months of court hearings and trauma and all kinds of other issues. Um, is that being that is that experienced at all in your county in your area or? from what you're telling me or what I'm hearing, it, it it's probably working well in your county. And maybe that's in Omaha or other parts of the state that the CF, and some of it's on CFS. The workers are not informing the individual families, bio families, that they have a right to peer support at the time that court petition is even filed. And so I'm just asking that question, is, that, is it different in your area? I think um, so. We cover we cover the central service area and the northern service area, or the region three and region four area. So there's 44 counties, and I don't even know how many CFS offices that is, but it's a lot. Um, some of those offices we have really great relationships with the workers, and they know about us, and they've been around for a long time. The turnover, I think, is part of the challenge, is just keeping those workers informed about what's available to them. And until they use the service, they don't know that the service is going to be as awesome as the service is. So, um, True. so that's a challenge. Um, I do think we have, with the family run orgs of Nebraska, we do have three family run orgs, just like Families Care, that cover the entire state of Nebraska. And that group came together with um, with CFS to build a family guidebook. And part of that guidebook is is a letter from us saying, hey, you have the right to this service and you're welcome to call us. But then there's lots of tools in that book that gives them education and information about what happens in their case, what hearings, what the different hearings do at different times, who's on their team, how they can get support if they need to file a grievance, how they can do that. Um, and then a, a workbook about like just building up strengths in the family and helping them build a safety plan and build a wellness plan and, and know, like, if, if I could tell my worker one thing, this is what it would be. And just to help build some of those skills, even if we don't get to be involved with a family. Um, but we were hoping that that might be like that initial, if that could go through a family's hand at that initial, um, at that initial intake, that would give them access to the service, even if a worker doesn't know about us. We do find our outcomes are much better if we get referred earlier. Um, I think the family is able to build a relationship with their worker faster um, when they have that person that can say, okay, look, this is this is what they're saying. They're not judging you for this, this, or this. They're saying we need to protect the kids. So what are we going to do to do that? And when they have that person that can help build that bridge, the outcomes are much better if we can do it earlier. 
I think I'm just going to call a time check. Um, we are behind on our agenda, but I think this is all really good information. So I just kind of want to do a pause. Do we want to keep going the way we're going and providing John this information or enable some of the conversations we had anticipated, which is hearing more from families care on how they connect with parents. So I'm, I'm just going to pause for a minute, ask, do we want to continue how we're moving forward with this to share more good ideas with John or Madam Leader. I'm um, sorry, I was just seeing who's on the um, call still and if Sam Kai's representative is on. I don't know. I don't think that person is on. Um, I, John, if you're okay with it, I think we continue to resource share just so you can gather some information and see how far we get by 145, that's 20 more minutes of resource sharing. And then <clears throat> we'll ask Jamie to talk about your programs. And since HHS is on, they may have been on for a while and then had to drop off. Um, but just invite them back maybe for the next meeting. Is that? I was just going to add just a suggestion if, if there's yeah. anybody that does need to leave, that they can yeah. go maybe on Zoom or at the tables, just in case. Is there anybody that has a meeting they need to get to pretty quickly or leave early? No. Zoom, anybody need to hop off early? Yeah, I want to make sure we get to Jason too, because I think the Hanny Rom Center is something we really want to make sure John hears about as well. It's um, innovative. Okay. okay, so more resource sharing. We've got another 20 minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> I was going to tell you that. So, say, um, my name is Dulce Valdez and I'm with ESU 9, um, the Migrant Education Program Coordinator. Uh, the Migrant Program uh, is a Title I-C program and we're under the umbrella of NDB. Uh, we provide services to uh, migrant students and for our purposes, migrant students um, are in anywhere from 0 to 21. Uh, so, anybody that, um, that has a right to an education. Uh, we are I guess our services are very limited to, to the zero and three year olds, but we do still uh, serve their families and support them. Um, for migrant students, for our purposes, again, is uh, somebody that uh, children that have moved to the area within the past three years and that their background and um, their parents' background or sometimes even their own background is uh, agricultural based work. <clears throat> um, and the main uh, goal areas that we work on is uh, education. So we try to remove any barriers um, they may have uh, so they can have uh, success in their education. Uh, we also do look at their um, basic needs. So we do um, initial needs assessments where, where we looked into um, the, the house's needs, you know, like are you, are you good with like your housing, uh, food security, uh, employment of their, their parents, are they stable, you know, if you have clothes, furniture to, um, I guess, to start off in your or new uh, town, we just uh, help them learn their resources around the area. And I guess once they're already enrolled in school, I mean, we do help them enroll in school sometimes, but sometimes they're already involved in school. We also help them uh, just to keep track of uh, are they doing good in school? Are they attending school? Are they having any behavior issues? And then try to bridge that communication with the school system, the parents in the school system, and um, and help the parents understand how the uh, school system works because it, many times uh, it's very different from their um, home countries. But even if it's not from a, a outside of the U.S., even district to district, there's a lot of changes. Even from here to Grand Island, there's going to be changes. So we help them understand how those may impact and just the laws and regulations of the uh, education system and just in general um, in the community. I'm Janelle Brown. I'm with the Kearney Area Children's Museum. Um, we just support play through interactive experiences. We offer programming and um, childcare in the form of camps. Um, and really, we're just still kind of navigating how we can best support our community and the families that we see. We have over 40,000 visitors um, in and out our doors every year. So we're just kind of figuring out how we can help be a connector and supporter of the families we see.
My name is Amber Cochran. I'm a Top Meals USA, and our main mission is to serve uh, meals after disasters, and we've gone all over the place. We've been in several different states, but we also do, like we serve um, several meals every day, actually. We serve meals during the pandemic, um, and then we also do the Christmas meal every year, and then we sometimes help with the Thanksgiving community meal. And so, and I guess my part in this group is maybe more as a parent because I have five kids in three different schools. So I think we've, I've had a kid in every school except some, we've only been in one elementary school, but every other school I've had a child at one point. So that's. And during the pandemic, um, Amanda's uh, group fed help me uh, with their hot meals um, on wheels and they go all over the place and I bet yeah. we delivered over a million meals to yeah. people over so, what two three months um, I think it okay so I think it was from <laughs> sometime the end of March until July yeah. they were our main yeah. provider of food for our community for um for months yeah. which was fantastic and we did the food box program after that too. So that, but that was kind of, that was in a few different states as well. So we we're kind of flexible and can help with whatever comes up. And your dad was just given the Elk Citizen of the Year award. Kind of <laughs> yeah, my, my father-in-law. Father okay. <laughs> yeah. it, this probably has, has to do with you guys as a family get the whole award because you guys did it all together. Yeah. So congratulations and thank you yeah. for all that. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> and I'm Wanda Fedorchik. I'm with Buffalo County Community Partners as well. And um, so I wear two hats there. I'm the substance abuse prevention coordinator, and I also am the central navigator for our community response team. So with central navigation, you're probably familiar with that. Um, uh, we help just coordinate services through the agencies, and then if there's a financial need that can't be met with all the existing agencies, we have resources to help with some of that, and then can connect folks with coaching services if they need more of that. Um, we do have a resource library, I guess. There's some operation parent handbooks back there and some other resources we can help get out to parents and people who need those resources. Uh, most recently, we're talking about transportation needs in the community. So that um, conversation is being held during our community response meetings, just to try to figure out how to overcome barriers in the community related to that. On the substance abuse prevention side, we're focusing a lot on opioid prevention and um, have a prescription take back coming up uh, April 22nd. So if you guys have families that need to get rid of medications, they can do that at CHI North parking lot on Saturday, April 22nd. From 10 to 2, um, there's also permanent sites throughout town. You can help those families get connected to those places to dispose of those meds. And then lock boxes are the, the big thing we're trying to do, um, not just for prescriptions and opioids, but we're also hearing that youth are getting their hands on like CBD gummies and some of those things that are being ingested and harmful um, to the kiddos as well. So we're trying to figure out how to use our lock box program to help keep kids safe. Yeah, yesterday, John, um, DHHS informed us of a few overdoses based on um, gummies. So that was something that we hadn't really seen or heard before. So that type of reaction of how, how do we just start getting our arms around with that really quickly and inform our community and what data does the state have to support that? What type of social marketing messages it needs to be quick, and right now everything we have um, is prepackaged and doesn't always address the immediate needs that we're seeing, especially with um, substance abuse. We've got to have a more reactive system to get that prevention information out there quicker. I also just kind of want to jump in because it relates to one of us talking about the central navigation. We're also kind of piloting, expanding those efforts. So um, one of those efforts is working with. Um, businesses, large employers in the community um, and their HR departments. So that way, um, you know, you've got employees who are maybe late to work all the time or have all these high needs. And instead of going from, okay, this you're on strike three, you're fired. 
how do we come in and you know with more preventative services and say well have we looked at are they able to pay their rent do they have food um, in their home and actually having somebody kind of connect them to those services and then again if there's still a higher need then we can um, connect them to jamie at families care and they can get some of that coaching and do a little more of the financial planning or whatever the needs might be um, and then we're also piloting that with child care. So we have coaches that are already working with child cares for other things like social emotional tools and pieces. Um, and we happen to be lucky with someone who has a behavioral health degree. So she's able to go in and say, you have families with these high needs. Let me help you refer them to those resources. And so just kind of expanding it to where the parents are already at and just kind of giving them that person that they trust that can help them connect to the resources. Can I ask a quick question? Where does community partners get their funding from today? Uh, 70 to 80 percent from state, local, and um, federal grants, and 20 percent by local donations. Thank you. Hi, John. My name is Candy Koenig. I work with the Monroe Liar Institute with the University of Nebraska Medical Center, um, but I'm here in Kearney. And I work with a couple different age groups. Um, I work with a lot of infants and young children who have disabilities or developmental delays and connect them with early intervention and community resources. Um, and then I also work with um, teenagers aging out of pediatrics and going into adult services and where they need much more intensive interventions like SSI waiver programs, um, things of that sort. I also learned this morning that um, we received a signed contract for a new grant through DHHS. So I will be the project manager for that and shifting my role a little bit. Um, and that will focus on access to behavioral and mental health services in schools across the state and getting that information into the hands of families, um, especially in our more pioneer school districts where resources are just difficult um, as a whole um, and trying to find resources for places that really don't have them. Can do you get referrals from CPS workers for higher needs youth also? I do no? not. Okay. Um, most of mine come from, well, they come from children's physicians here in town. Um, I also do outreach clinics from UNMC. So I go to genetics clinics, tips clinics, behavioral health. Um, but some of my peers in other parts of the state get other referrals from other sources depending on who they're contracted with. Okay, thanks. And then John, I'm Ellery Butterfield. I'm the youth coordinator for the community partners. And uh, one of my main roles um, is to help run the youth advisory board. As far as I know, the youth advisory board of Buffalo County is the only cross school, cross county Youth Advisory Board. So we're made up of uh, students from each of the schools within Buffalo County. And it's also the only Youth Advisory Board I know of that works specifically with high school students and not with um, older youth, college-aged youth. So um, it would be very excited for uh, you to maybe come um, talk with the students at some point regarding the work that you're doing, especially if you want to get a youth perspective. And I very much encourage you to get a youth perspective into this work. Um, and then the other resource that I have to offer is the Reaching Teens Work Group. Um, this is a toolkit that we use uh, to connect with teenagers um, that it has been developed as an evidence-based practice. Um, and we meet once a month if anybody is thinking, oh, I would like to uh, connect better with the teenagers in my community. Um, it's a really short meeting. We meet for about 45 minutes and just kind of talk about trends that we're seeing with the youth in our communities. And um, then we watch a little video about best ways to connect with them. So last week I learned about things that you should text versus things that you shouldn't text. So I'm very interested. If anybody would like to be invited to those meetings, I would be, I would be very glad to have you there. And Reaching Teens is Dr. Kenneth Ginsburg. So many of you may be, maybe are familiar with him. He's phenomenal. And 
Can I ask a question on the youth advisory board? Are there any youth on that board that are currently or have been in foster care that have lived experience in the system? We current, currently no. That is something that we're focusing on. We're about to start our recruiting for this upcoming year, and that has been one of our main focuses is that we'd like to expand to be a little bit more reflective of the students that are inside of our school. So um, one, we'd like to get some students from the Handy Iran Center and then uh, also focusing on, we are bringing in a foster, um, the LEAP program, the Lived uh, Learning and Earning to Achieve Potential um, is a foster youth program that is gonna be coming in to talk with our students next month. So yes, we will be growing in that direction. Okay, excellent. You might tap into uh, Project Everlast. They um, work with youth that are either in care or transitioned out of care, and they might have a youth advisory board. And then that's on the line. I, I definitely want to meet with them. That would be great if we could have a time to chat with them. And I, I think that any youth advisory board is very important. Very important. And I, I didn't hear anything about... Um, the more of the tribes, are there any issues of tribal concerns in your area or is that a non-issue in your area? We had a discussion around that. Um, we're honestly just kind of beginning discussions around that. I just reached out to um, Echo, left hand Echo Hawk, I believe this is his name, um, uh, just a couple weeks ago to kind of talk about how we could better connect with some of those students. Um, also, if you want an aim for Project Everlast, I do have uh, Brandon Andretti meeting with me um, this week, and I would be very glad to introduce the two of you. I think that he kind of helps organize the youth advisory there. That would be wonderful. And you have, again, info at stephengroupinc.com. You can connect with me directly, or you can go through Nanette, who works at DHHS and sets up all the discussions. We could do virtual we have to. I like to be in person if we can, but you know we can we can do whatever. But it's really important that we get that voice. Thank you so much, John. There's also, and I think they still do this. Um, HHS has tribe specific staff housed in their offices for CPS. Yes. Um, yes, we're very aware. Yeah. Okay. We've very been nice we met with them last week, and Nanette set up a meeting. We met with the tribes, with the staff, and. Very, very, it was a very important meeting for us to hear their concerns and their issues. And we learned a lot. And that's that's what this process is about. So we could bring it to the work group and let them know that, you know, part of the framework has to be involving list, not just listening to the voices, but co-creation. Co and a lot of that's going to happen in the next few months. So that's why I want them all to be a part of it. So very appreciative of that. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Veronica Levine. I'm the prevention coordinator at the Safe Center um, here in Kearney. Um, we're, um, we work with uh, individuals um, who have experienced um, any type of violence, so domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, stalking, or, or dating violence, and providing any resources and support that they need. Um, just to name a few, we have an emergency shelter, a 24-hour crisis line, um, we offer uh, free counseling, um, and we uh, work with various other agencies in the community to provide resources uh, that our clients need. Um, and on the prevention side, um, we try to engage youth and young adults in violence prevention um, through providing education, through um, presentations, you know, going into um, schools. So we cover uh, five counties, so Buffalo, Franklin, Harlan, um, Phelps and Carney, Carney, <laughs> if I didn't name that. Um, so yeah, tr um, trying to engage with youth, um, going into schools and providing presentations, and um, you know, doing some presentations with young adults at uh, the local university. And John, we did just uh, we being Buffalo County Community Partners just added the Safe Center as one of our coaching. Um, uh, referrals for our community response, which is also paid by Nebraska Children and Families. And so they're providing coaching for um, those individuals coming through community response. 
that are non-domestic violence or abuse uh, when we when we have kind of an overflow and uh, needing some additional bilingual supports they currently have a case manager that can help us with that we also are beginning conversations with family advocacy network or um, hopefully you're connected with project harmony um, those two are really interesting models in the state of nebraska and so we've been uh, beginning conversations about uh, as families are entering the DHHS system and being able to separate neglect from abuse, and then how we might be able to intervene with some coaching and what that coaching might look like with the Safe Center and the Family Advocacy Network uh, on the front end of that, kind of a little bit of the, that conversation you were asking earlier. So that's just beginning conversations in that space. I'm Sarah Solana. One I'm area, Sarah. if I can just highlight one area though, just in the future state, there's some statutes in Nebraska that are very restrictive and especially the case management statute it is very unlike a lot of other states. So down the road, if the framework is developed and the work group decides to move forward to change, uh, recommend changes to some of those statutes so that prevention can happen with, without having to open up a case without having to have a case manager involved. So the community can actually do their work without, and again, report to the state, continue to have that bi-directional feed like some other states are doing. It's going to require statutory changes, at least from my own, my team's original look. So the um, reason I'm saying that is it may be really important to stay involved and stay connected because there'll have to be some voices in the legislature at the end. I can see that coming because all the great work that you're doing and pay, you're building that foundation that you already have through the foundation efforts, but some of that is restricted by that barrier I mentioned. So I have a question and it's actually for Nanette. Sorry, John, I've been talking to you a lot. Um, Nanette, would that approach be like a step under alternative response? Like yeah. Where there's, okay, preventative yeah. care. Not mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we were thinking. Okay, sounds good, thank you. So I'm Sarah Son with the City of Kearney. I'm a new board member to the Buffalo County Community Partners, and I was actually just here to see if I had anything to contribute or if this is something that I wanted to be part of. I don't have anything to contribute, so. But you're gonna come back to see you. Maybe. <laughs> Am I the one? I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. You're welcome. Yeah. She's doing the Buffalo County Community Partner Coalition Collaborative Tour. Yes, that's what I Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm back we're at 147, just so we know. I will not so say. fast. Uh, my name is, hi, John. My name is Nadia Asadi. I'm a uh, past chair of the Buffalo County Community Partners. Been on the board for six years. Um, I am very humbled and proud of our community and the amazing people who do good work every day. And if you don't already think so, we have a very unique community. That's my sharing. <laughs> You've already you've obviously done some good work paving the way, and um, I'm hearing great things just out there in the community of, about the all the collaboratives. So, I think the important thing when we come out to Kearney too is is really discuss um, the resource needs going forward too. If if there is going to be um, like that step before even alternative response in the future, and really important, you know, what are some of the things needed? technology, what are some of the things in terms of staffing resources and others too. So I, I appreciate it all. Yeah, you did. Hi John, I'm Jason Owens. I'm the principal here at the facility we're in right now. It's called the Hany Aram Center for Success. It's a non-traditional school for grades six through 12. And I actually have some kids who are past their graduation year of 12. So I call it 12 plus. Um, we have a lot of different programming to help those kids. A lot of the kids that we serve come with attendance issues, with anxiety issues, especially after the pandemic. Um, we have a night school program that we serve kids. Uh, so we have kids coming from 7 a.m. all the way till 8 p.m. on some days. Um, I've got a great staff here we serve about 50 kids a day on most days some days at 70. Um, we have our suspension services so when kids get long-term suspended in Kearney Public 
we serve those kids in grades six to 12. Um, I think right now we're serving 15 suspended kids and four expelled kids um, in one of our programs. So we're just, we're a little different than every other school around and we like that. Um, I don't know what else I can share. I, I always feel like I always share that. But, um, other than he's absolutely amazing and we're so lucky to have him as a principal here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Saying it's not like any other school is an understatement. Like they're they're literally doing miracle here in the community. It's it's crazy to watch. And crazy to see the difference in the kids that come and, and are involved here. And it's truly an honor to meet one of their graduates. I've met a few along the way, and they're they're so proud of their graduation certificate from the Hand and Rome Center. Do you just introduce yourself, even if you don't watch the um, I'm asking if you have never been using fit and PE butters. Okay. And John, do you, a, I've asked Michelle on Zoom yeah. to have everybody start posting in the chat. So I, I'm hoping everybody in the chat has shared with you, John, along the way. So you're getting a lot of that information as well. Uh, I am the last one to introduce. And John, we can follow up with an email. I know we're doing uh, the board of directors in a couple of weeks. Hopefully you all heard John say, if you have groups that are meeting, if you want some private time with him, he's available. We'll check out his contact information that he shared with you a couple of times so that you can provide additional information to him. And also, I'm sure if he has questions, he can follow up with you. So thank you, John, for spending um, this amount of time with us today. I, I really think it was beneficial for all of us to hear more deeply about the work we're doing and really have an opportunity to share the gaps and challenges we see as, as well as the excitements and accomplishments uh, for, the, for the state to see. So thank you so much for spending this time with us. And Our pleasure. Time. Um, for anybody that is on by Zoom, I know that you guys put some information in the chat, but is there anything you want to share with the group verbally? Otherwise, we'll just put it in notes um, for the meeting minutes. Don't be shy. Yeah. Jessica, I hope you put something in the chat. <laughs> or come up with that's what I was getting at. Or come up with me. I did. Anything you want to share with the group in person or you want us just to kick it out in an email? Um, well, I, I did put it in the chat, but I'm Jessica Vickers. I'm with Livewell Counseling. Um, we have our in-school counseling program and we contract with area schools to provide on-site services. Um, I did list the schools in the chat because it gets kind of lengthy. Um, our biggest school district being Kearney Public Schools that we serve. Um, I've had the lovely pleasure of working with Jason and Hanny Aram, and I heard Nikki, I hear voices in the room. I can't hear everything, but I can hear voices in the room. I think I heard Nikki Peterson, um, and I mean, a lot of you folks I heard, but um, I know those folks specifically with the schools I've had a pleasure to work with. Um, and we're also a region three network provider. So part of our program is we're able to offer financial assistance to families who financially qualify for, for those services. Um, in addition to that, we do offer counseling services um, to all ages. Um, but uh, probably for this group, our, our most valuable resource is our school program. And Jessica, I believe you have a very well-crafted email to Tan and I with one of your greatest challenges right now. That would be fantastic to share with John. Um, yeah, it's kind of complex. <laughs> um, so part of our work with Region 3 is we um, our program and funds all have to be approved um, not only through Region 3, but at the state level through the Division of Behavioral Health. Um, and right now, not just our region, but all regions across um, have echoed concern with there's a lot of rigidity in some of the guidelines and um, different things we have to follow to provide the services for for our, our communities. Um, and they kind of keep getting more rigid and more rigid. And so recently they made some changes in how the funding 
um, can be allocated. Um, we used to have a little bit more flexibility in different language around co-pays and co-insurance and how we could still get um, some financial assistance for that covered. Um, and now the new language is if, if insurance covers anything, um, we can't provide financial assistance to those families, even if they financially qualify. So essentially they're saying if there's another payer source like insurance, um, Medicaid, it's covered, like that's not a concern, um, which is concerning because we do have families that just because they have insurance doesn't mean it's affordable. Um, and so we have folks that we either have to decide that we are going to have to come up with some kind of scale to charge them for a rate so our services can, can continue. Um, or or just not offer that, or, or they just wouldn't financially qualify and then themselves would have to decide if they're gonna go without the service or, or pay the fees. Um, so it's a little bit of a dilemma. Um, we're hopeful, um, we're very fortunate region three and all the regions actually, I can't remember if the hearing is today or if it's tomorrow, are actually advocating at the state level to try to gain some more flexibility um, in some of these rules. But as you know, even if we are successful, that we won't see the trickle down effect for some time because um, nothing moves fast at the state level. <laughs> um, so that's so funding's a little bit of an uh, a little bit of a challenge um, right now for for us. Um, and so I've reached out to Buffalo County Partners to help us kind of brainstorm looking at some new options to make sure that these services we're offering to families continue to be affordable. Sorry, I just and Jessica, to Jessica show. I, I just bunch. yeah, I just want to make sure that in is on and that, that we reach out to you when we're in the area because I, I'm going to be with my behavioral health expert on the team, mm -hmm. and we are very interested in how the regional system can also connect with the managed care system and the child welfare system, and yeah. that's a really important important issue here. So I really would appreciate if you're, you or others would be available to talk more about the region three behavioral health system. Um, I can do my best as far as our experience. I know if you, if you reach out to our region, I'm sure they would also be more than happy. They usually are very, very supportive in, in all initiatives um, that we are working on to expand services. Did I kind of capture that, Denise? <laughs> My email was probably a little bit well-worded. Your email um, was fantastic. I just thought you have the audience that really needs to hear it. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I know we got some school folks there. I, um, do not worry this right now. We're, we're still good, guys. So I don't <laughs> want you guys to be panicking. Um, we're just trying to really be proactive to be ahead of this before it it does cause some real barriers. We're in this together, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jamie, I know we don't have tons of time and if people have to leave early, that's fine. Um, but I wanna circle back and anything that you didn't already share during resource sharing, do you wanna share out now about your programs and how you get referrals and what you provide? Sure. Um, <clears throat> referrals, we have so many different programs. Um, I can I can give you all the details of every program we offer. The best thing to do if you want to make a referral is just call our office. Carla and I can, we will decide what program is best and where that funding will come from. Um, there's not a whole lot of people that come in our door that we can't serve or that we won't find a way to serve. So um, you know, the, the biggest requirements that we have for most of our programs is that they have a second behavioral health service of some kind. So, um, but we do have a couple that don't have that requirement and sometimes we can sniff in there. So it, it's always best just to call. Um, we have utilized some of our small grant money to help fund families that need the service and aren't able to access it through our other programs. So um, we also have we do have a bilingual family peer support specialist starting soon, so they will be getting trained. Um, they'll be getting trained and be ready to start here probably in the next four to six weeks. So, um, as far as our parent leadership group goes, um, if your agency or board or you know uh, group would like some input from from parent leadership, we do have 
We have a pretty strong group here in Kearney and Buffalo County. So um, we do have parents that are willing and, and able and excited to serve. Um, we also have some that are really nervous about that um, and might need some support in that. And so we, um, the Family Rent Awards offer some mentorship for them to support them and help them prep for meetings and, and debrief after meetings and, and just understand how the process works and those things since you know they don't have that experience. Um, <clears throat> there is a parent charter that we've developed, um, the Parent Leaders of Nebraska, um, and it really is just kind of a kind of a roadmap for how a parent can serve and what that relationship between an agency and a parent can can look like. So um, if that's something that's of interest, I'm, I'm always excited to have people come on. We meet once a month. Um, you're always welcome to come on and, and ask, you know, for a parent volunteer to participate. Um, and we have, I would say we've probably trained 50 parents over the last three or four years, and we have an active group of probably 12. Um, we have a three parents serving on the Nebraska Supreme Court Commission for Children in the Courts. We have um, a couple serving in Region 6, like in their consumer, um, oh, what do they call it, consumer coalition, I think. Um, and then we have a couple that are serving on the advisory board at Region 3. So we've got some parents that are actively involved. And then we've got some that have taken the training and become peer support specialists. So um, it's it's exciting work and we're hoping to grow it with next year. I don't know, did I miss anything? I know you guys had me here for a reason, but remember what I was supposed to talk uh, about. Maybe just a, a quick circle of um, why we're all here. And maybe we can also help John, uh, the reason we all are coming together. Uh, we, we talked about some short-term goals as a group uh, to build relationships with existing parent groups so that we can begin to learn from parents in our community and um, help to present questions and maybe co-design work uh, with parents. We have some amazing stars like uh, Families Care and the work that Jamie's doing because she in our community is really leading the charge in this space. So we wanted to, to just learn more from Jamie to figure out how we can build more co-designed work with the parents that she's working with. Um, DHHS was also gonna come on board. They have a group called the Advocate Family Advocacy Unit, uh, where they're also uh, training parents and engaging parents. There is a parent um, who lives in Omaha that I believe Sam was going to talk to, Sam Kime at DHHS, to see if they would be interested in joining this group. But at this point, there are no Buffalo County parents that are part of that uh, Family Advocacy Unit, I believe is what the name of it is. So that was a little bit of what we wanted Sam um, to talk to you guys as well about um, so we can bring her back maybe at the next meeting. And John, our focus is supporting parents and caregivers um, uh, of children who are in those most important developmental stages of zero to three and then pre-adolescence when we know brain development is so vitally important. And so that's what we're, this group is holding in front of themselves. Uh, their short-term goal was to build um, parent resources uh, we had a lot of really great ideas, but then we stepped back and we said, well, we're, we maybe aren't the target audience. We need to learn more from parents, which is why we were asking Jamie, how can we find out more from parents where they want to find resources, where they're looking for resources, where do we need to be centering our time as service providers in sharing those resources or where they need to be available and how we can make them more easily understandable. Uh, our long-term goal was a, something around access centers in the community. So if there are certain, you know, let's say we have a handful of, of organizations like Families Care that we say are access points, and we just make sure that we have all the resources we can possibly think that we cover those access points and make sure that those referrals are happening um, within those major access points for community or for parents. So those are some of the things that we've been thinking about. We're stalled out a little bit because we don't want to build it without knowing if this is what parents are wanting. So that's the stage we're in right now is how do we find out from parents how they're looking for resources, where they want to find the resources, and what resources have been most helpful to them so we know where they're already traveling to get resources so we can support them in those spaces. Did I, anything else from the group? No. Um, on your tables are the laminated um, copies of kind of our petal diagram where everything kind of cross sectors um, together. Uh, John, do you have any additional questions for the group before we 
adjourn or does anybody else have any questions no this is this has been real informative I'm I'm late for another meeting, but I wanted to hear because I, I really wanted to spend as much time as possible. The, the issue for me is going to be to continue to work with you all to get as much information so I can get it to the work group. And so your voices, the parents' voices, and the community's voices are going to be really important. I do see if I had to just, my foresight going forward is that I think this work group is going to really focus on prevention upstream. And we just need to make sure that the Nebraska communities going forward are ready for this challenge. It's 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 a lot and it's happening in a number of states right now. It's exciting on the at risk of child welfare intervention side. And, you know, I'm so excited to just meet with you all. And I'm excited that the foundation has built a lot already. So this is all great. And um, I'm going to look forward to seeing you in Carney when we're there in May. But you know the link. You have the website. Send us any information, any questions, any documents going forward. And again, this is. And it's not just early childhood. It's so important for me to hear today because the Department of Education handles a lot in your state in that area too. And they're part of the work group. And this is this is also a lot about zero to three. It's about even um, prenatal. And it's about making sure that moms get what they need in the community when they're you know delivering and there's a risk of substance abuse. And again, it's keeping individuals out of the system and families the best we can. And, and the answer is always community in any state, but a lot of states, the communities aren't connected. And you you all seem really connected. So in the future, we'll just be talking more about it. I really appreciate the invite too. Um, Don, do you have a contact for that plan of state care pilot in Hastings? Have you touched base with them yet? No, I do know about it, but I don't have a contact. Can you um, send that to that link? Or you yep. can even send it directly to me. My email address, jstephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, at stephengroupinc.com. J-S-T-E-P-H-E-N, at stephengroupinc.com. Okay? Thanks, all. Yep, I just Thanks. Thank you, everybody. You know, we didn't really follow our agenda, but I think it was really a good conversation. So thank you for coming here. We don't get opportunities like this in the state of Nebraska very often. The language, I, the latest language I've been hearing um, the state use is we're moving away from the state welfare child welfare system to a child well-being system. So that's yeah. the language I've been using with 11, uh, LB 1173. So if you're trying to share this with other, that's the layman's term of what I've been hearing people use, which I think people get behind on. Next meeting? Yeah. You know when the next meeting is? Do we have it on there? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> April 26th. Now I know. April 26th. Same place, same bat channel. Come hang out with us. I don't know who's providing lunch. Maybe Denise is going to make homemade things. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> Everybody better come now. I'm announcing it on Facebook. I'm putting it linked in. Spread the word. I know we haven't thought about it yet, too, but yep. just thinking in preparation if John and the Stephen group is going to be back in Kearney in May, that we might focus our conversation on the things that maybe we didn't completely get to today, but also how can we um, support that May 31st meeting and inform mm -hmm. the work that they're doing? Is that May 31st meeting replacing? The meeting we ignore. I see it's that on is the meeting that they have said. That is something meeting. totally separate. Okay, so yeah, our I, meeting is the 24th of May. What I told John is I will send him a list of all of you that are in this group. Um, I will invite you again when I find out a specific time that he's planning on having the community open forum. But I also wrote down when he said, I want to talk more with you, like partner schools or, you know, families care. I wrote those things down and I will follow up with an email with him and his scheduler with those contact names, or I might just even CC. I'll figure that out and get that all connected um, because he's going to want to start scheduling meetings one-on-one. -on -one. I think you've maybe heard him say that a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings while he's here. The other piece I still need to plug in too, and this is probably for Emily or those of you who are in other collaboratives outside of Buffalo County, those in our central region all know he's coming and the closest um, that they can get to is Columbus or Scotts Bluff. So we're gonna get a lot of everybody from the state coming in that day. 
So I do have some of those collaborative leaders uh, asking for time in here too. So we'll we'll start to fit in all of those pieces while he's here on the, around that time. And I don't think it's just the 31st. I think he is spending a couple of days in Carmel. So I think he'll have time to, to meet with people individually. So we'll email out his link information so you can follow up with him directly too. Um, he does have a scheduler. So just make sure that scheduler um, is included in that conversation you're having with him. So we, we can follow up with some of those pieces. But I do envision one meeting that's gonna be a public forum and the rest will be individual or however you want to engage him, he's willing. I told him we had 10, maybe 15 minutes today, so. <laughs> we don't follow the rules around you these parts. Well that way. It's the wild west when I run the meetings by yeah. myself on the say. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with us through the agenda changes. I'm sorry we didn't get to everything that we probably needed to talk about today, but there's always the next meeting. Uh, if you guys need anything, email any of the facilitators, um, and we will best meet your needs. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next time. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.